Hello and welcome to the Raptors Extra Weekly Podcast. I'm your Samson Folk, and today a very special guest, friend of the show, and one of my favorite people to have on. He's a contributor over at GQ 538 and co-host the Open Four Podcast. Michael Pina, how are you doing today, man? My man, I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. How are you? I feel good. I've said this before, but inertia is the word. Inertia in my personal life, inertia in my work life, and just trying to keep everything rolling forward. You don't push too hard. You just There's this sense of momentum in my life that I hope to just keep pushing me, if, if that makes sense. That's deep. No, that's deep. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm glad. I'm glad I could get deep right away. You wrote a very, as far as, and not to say anything bad about sports journalism, but I've been doing it for some time. Rarely do I get the opportunity to have the types of discussions with people and especially with athletes that you were able to have with Jalen Brown. That's what I want to touch on first. A huge piece you wrote for GQ. You can find it in the, the physical magazine. You can find it online. When you get in a room with Jalen Brown, what is the first thing you're thinking about given all that's happened in the NBA and with his involvement in it? Yeah, so I knew, I mean, I for every interview that I have where I know that I have um, a decent amount of time, which is over an hour at this point, which is kind of depressing, but when I have a decent amount of time with a subject, you know, I have... Uh, pages of questions that I want to get to. And I know that there's no chance that I'm going to get to all of them, but I want to be prepared just in case, you know, a conversation dips or dives and I I just want to be ready for where he's willing to go. And so for Jalen, you know, usually I'll have a ton of basketball related questions for guys. Like uh, um, it could be, anything related to team chemistry to uh on court production their role etc um with Jalen I had like I had over 60 or 70 questions printed out in front of me and maybe like five or six had to do with basketball and I mean that speaks more to how unique he is as a person as a thinker as someone who is uh, so engaged with uh, off court and things that have really nothing to do with sports in a lot of ways, um, uh, issues and problems and dilemmas and, um, and, and of the like in society. So uh, having an opportunity to just chat with him about what was going on in his mind a few weeks after the bubble, which was when we, we sat down to talk, um, you know, I wanted to have him reflect on the bubble experience and he was very open to that. He's also a pretty, uh, pretty guarded person. So personal questions about, uh, himself, he was deflective, but questions about issues that he thinks a lot about, he was very willing to engage with, which I really appreciated. And then I got, some of the more personal stuff from people around him, which is usually the case when you're profiling a subject. Um, but, but yeah, he, he's, I mean, I said this to you before we started recording, but he was someone who I'd always really wanted to profile and write about. And I'm just really fortunate to have had the opportunity. I find that when you're talking to a brilliant person, a simple question can elicit a remarkable answer just because of the way they see the world. And your question in your piece about him, who would he have dinner with, turned into, you know, as you write in the piece, kind of a jumping off point that made the the interview go a lot better. And that was extremely engaging to him. I think that's great that you get to interview somebody like that and that we get to see it put in print. Is there any questions that you didn't get to that you really wish you could have bounced off of him? Wow, that's a great question. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, you know, I think, I mean, we spent a lot of time talking about, a lot of time talking about books and a little bit of it got in the story. I mean, like the the interview transcript is pretty extensive, obviously, compared to what ended up in the piece. So a lot of stuff, we went deep on a lot of things that didn't, 
make the cut. Um, I, I mean, I got to a lot of what I wanted, I think. I mean, always in these situations, there are follow-up questions that you kind of kick yourself uh, after the fact when you're transcribing it and you're just kind of like, why didn't I ask a simple follow-up to this question? It could have taken the interview in a much different direction that could have, you know, had me learn a lot more about him and about what he's thinking. So maybe I'm just like being too hard on myself and I can't really think of anything um, in particular where that was the case. I know there were a few instances of that when I was transcribing it. And um, I think that uh, it's just this constant juggling act when you are interviewing someone and you have a time limit and um, I threw out the, uh, that dinner question for him. I didn't even have that written down. It just honestly came to me on a whim because I'd asked him three or four straight questions about basketball and his answers were like either one word or, and this is after like, you know, um, we were having like long debates so like his answers were like of, of one, one or two words um, and it was getting a little awkward. And so I threw, just threw that out there and he like literally popped up, like came alive, like he had an adrenaline shot in his chest. Um, and his answer to that question was a lot longer than what made the piece. Um, and he really explained each one in detail <laughs> in a way that would have made the story like, uh, 5,000 words. Um, but he, what honestly really impressed me was like, I knew he was really intelligent just cause I'm a Celtics fan. I've watched every one of his games. I've really followed his career. I've followed his statements. I've followed his work with, um, his MIT fellowship, his speeches, uh, at Harvard, his, he did a Ted talk. Like I've watched all of that before I interviewed him. Um, so I'm really familiar with what he wants to, what he has to say about things. Um, but, but yeah, he was, he was great. And, and, um, and yeah, I really can't say too many nice things about him. I mean, what I was going to say is just like, we, I, I, I I'm blanking on what I was about to say, but, um, but no, he was, he was, uh, he was terrific. And uh, it was a very, very enjoyable interview. When you look at Jalen Brown, the amount of people who say, look how involved he was in what went on in the bubble, specifically thinking about what you cite in your piece, him standing up and saying, the Milwaukee Bucks, you don't have to explain what you did or why you did it. He, he just supported them fully through and through. And then you look at, and not to disparage LeBron James, but LeBron James being marketed now as the face of that movement that went on in August and how there are comments that seem a little bit disparaging towards the Bucks, in particular about the brotherhood in the NBA. Do you find that interesting at all? Yes, I do find it interesting. I think it's a very complex issue. I go back and forth on it in my own head when I think about, um, I think about ego and credit and these different factors that, from the outside looking in appear to take place and take part in a movement that should be void of them in a lot of ways, but everyone's human. And so, and I might be projecting honestly also mm -hmm. on someone like LeBron and what he was thinking and, uh, uh, what his mentality was and what his approach was in the bubble and what his focus was because, LeBron did a lot of wonderful things um, uh, with regards to voting rights that he was still able to accomplish uh, while playing in the bubble and while focusing on trying to win a championship, which at the end of the day is that's his job. That's what he wants to do. And uh, you can't really disparage it too much. I mean, that's just the expectations and, uh, the pressure that I think sometimes we put on professional athletes to speak on issues and to act out in ways that we 
deem progressive and, and, and align with our values. Like at the end of the day, like we should also put that pressure on people who are more in, I mean, these athletes have platforms uh, for sure, but there are others who are actual in decision-making positions who should have uh, more pressure placed on them if that makes any sense. And so sometimes I get frustrated when we criticize the players for either speaking out or not speaking out or speaking out, but not speaking out uh, as much as we would like when the criticism should be directed elsewhere, if that makes any sense. I think that makes perfect sense. And maybe even a little bit, it'll help me form my opinion. Whereas I'm viewing this situation, at least the way I asked the question about trying not to make it versus Jalen Brown versus LeBron in this way, just wondering about how they're both being viewed in this light. But you come with the answer of there are other people who are paid for that specific action, for that specific thing in the political arena that obviously are doing much less than even some of the athletes. So I, I think that's a good way to answer it. And as you say, it's it's tough. It's complex. And there was enough space for you to write your piece on Jalen Brown and there was enough space for a huge piece to be written about LeBron James. So hopefully people can just discern as they like and everything can fit in going forward. I think that's the, the happy medium we're looking for. I have uh, one more question regarding the Jalen Brown piece, and, uh, and then we can move on if that's cool. Of course. Okay, so Jalen Brown, very young, very accomplished. You talked about all of the things going on for him in his career on the court and off the court in your piece. One of the most interesting things I think is that Jalen Brown represents kind of a throwback in some ways, but also the new age of athlete. Do you think that, man, I don't know, maybe this is too much. (laughs) Do you think that he's setting himself up to be an icon? As, As was commented in the story, people are projecting him as perhaps the next president of the Players Association. He is very dominant on the floor. He's projecting as one of the better wing players coming up in the league. And he is one of the most conscientious and intelligent athletes that has ever been on a stage as big as he is. Do you think that he's a blueprint or do you think that it's just, he is who he is. It's no indication of where the league is going. Anything like that. I think that someone as intelligent and as motivated to be as engaged as Jalen is and to apply uh, his curiosity towards issues that will make it easier for people who are less fortunate. Um, I think that he is fortunate enough to exist in an era where that is socially acceptable uh, to the majority of people who follow the sport, I would say, and the majority of people who actually are listening to what he says. So, you know, I asked this, almost this exact same question to Isaiah Thomas, the older Isaiah Thomas. And, um, you know, I was like, I think I worded it. Does, does anyone from your era, um, you know, the eighties, early nineties remind you of Jalen in how he approaches, uh, social issues. And Isaiah's answer was there were a ton of Jalen Brown's in the NBA when I played, but they never had the opportunity um, or the ability to voice their opinion for myriad reasons, be it uh, a majority of the people who were covering the league were white conservatives. Um, There was no social media. There was uh, uh, the general outlook in the country at that time was different in terms of race relations. Uh, If you were to speak out as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, me and Isaiah Thomas had this whole conversation about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and how Kareem writes in his first autobiography, um, you know, he wanted to speak out about racism and police brutality in the 60s and 70s um, and ended up boycotting the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. Um, But when he did things like that, he was harshly criticized and it impacted his career and it impacted his reputation. And he was deemed surly by the media. And a lot of people think of him as being this disgruntled, angry individual when he's 
eloquent and has published like 15 books and um, is brilliant in his own right. So that's just one example. Um, and that's like the best player too. There's like, it's like Jalen Brown isn't the, isn't the best player in the league. He didn't even make the all-star team. He's never been an all-star. And we're talking about Kareem, who's the all-time points leader and like a six-time MVP, six time, whatever he is, just like an icon. Um, and he was very limited in that time. So it's like, I, to answer your question, I think that Jalen is coming in the right time. Time is on his side. And with regards to his future, like uh, the first draft of my story was going to end on trying to project what he can accomplish going forward. But everyone who I talked to when I posed that question basically was just like, whatever Jalen wants to do, uh, he's going to do. And he's that smart and that motivated and like the, the sky is truly the limit with this person. Yeah. I think that's the best way to put it. You, you answered a question I didn't ask, but it's probably the question I should have asked is that he came along at the right time and he's in a position where he's more able to rally people to his cause because of what the public thinks of his particular messaging and his beliefs. So I think that's the place to do it. But before we get off this topic, is there any tidbits, provided there's no breach of anything, any tidbits that you wish could have made the piece that didn't? Uh, there were a few, honestly. Um, st- stuff that had like nothing to do with anything that just I like, came across in reporting it that I thought was hilarious. Like uh, I talked to the, I, I guess the younger Isaiah Thomas, like the active player Isaiah Thomas, even though I don't think he's on a team right now. Um, who was teammates with Jalen when Jalen was a rookie. And I was just asking him about, you know, Jalen's when Jalen first was drafted and came to the Celtics, he had a very uh, bumpy uh, adjustment period uh, coming from college to the NBA in terms of, um, you know, uh, rookie duties and uh, just not accepting the way things were quote unquote. And so Isaiah tells the story about how, um, one of Jalen's responsibilities as a rookie was to uh, pack soap for road trips for all the players. And he just straight up was like, I'm not doing that. And so uh, Isaiah had the team managers during a game uh, fill his car with popcorn. And Jalen was upset about that. So when that game ends, he goes to his car, he opens the door and just popcorn spills out from like the floor to the roof. And um, Jalen was very upset and took a while to get over it. And he had family in town as well, watching him for the first time. And they went to drive home and they basically couldn't. So uh, it was just like a whole mess of a thing. And Isaiah was, it's obviously funny now. And uh, Isaiah was laughing throughout the story and I really enjoyed hearing that. But like that, that type of story, like, um, I mean, the tone of the piece was trying to be a little bit more uh, uh, serious. And there were some stories like that that I got that I just, I loved and cherished, but I, I don't think they would have made sense in the article. That, no, that definitely does make sense. It doesn't fit the, the tone really, but a good story for sure. I've never, I've never understood that the rookies, I feel like they invent stuff for the rookies to do, right? Because the basketball team, there's so many people to help out that it confuses me when Matisse, Matisse Thibault comes on the plane and they're like, you didn't get the biscuits from Popeye's or they're telling rookies to carry all this stuff around. And is that not covered by the team or are they truly just creating things for rookies to do? Truly creating things for rookies to do is my sense. Yes. What a mess. I don't, I, I don't mess. think that they absolutely need to do that. No. Uh, anyway. Okay. <laughs> glad, uh, glad we could get my curiosity out of the way. I brought you here mostly because I wanted to talk about Jalen Brown, but that doesn't fit the Raptors podcast that much. So we're going to talk about some stuff in the East. And so we're going to talk about the East basically. And so I've it tiered out. And if you disagree, you'll let me know afterwards. So I'll read out the tiers I have. We'll discuss the top end, the bottom end accordingly. So my tiers, first tier is, let's say, for sure, they have to contend this year. That's what their team is built for. Bucks, Heat, Celtics. 
next year, I could see every single one of these teams reaching the finals if something breaks right. Some are more realistic than others, and that's the 76ers, the Raptors, and the Nets. The next tier is we'll make the playoffs, we'll not make the finals. Definitively, I just can't see it. That's Indiana. And then you have the 7 to 10 range, which is Atlanta, Washington, Orlando. The next one, Charlotte, Chicago. I don't think are those of those teams will make the playoffs. However, I think that they could be fun offensively. They could win a few games. And then that last tier, Detroit, New York, Cleveland. And that's long-winded, Michael. But I'm going to ask you to pick it apart for me really quick. Okay. Um, do you want to start at the top or the bottom? Top. Let's do top. Okay. I mean, I said I told you this before we started recording. I, I think... Like if I were to tier these teams, these top six teams, Bucks, Heat, Celtics, Sixers, Raptors, Nets, like I think they're all very, very close. I'm going to take out four of those teams and put them in a first tier and like ask me tomorrow and I'll probably have a different tier. But the four teams that I think are in the top, tippity top, like the teams that are going to have home court in the East, I think are Milwaukee, Boston, Brooklyn and Philadelphia. And this is not to disrespect the Miami Heat who just went to the finals or the I Toronto love Raptors. It, it's so good. <laughs> or the, or the t- Toronto Raptors who um uh you know they they had a pretty interesting offseason. They've re-signed uh Fred Van Vliet, which was like the most important thing they could do. And I assume Pascal Siakam will look a lot better next year than he did in the bubble. Um losing the starting front court is a little worrisome, and I think Aaron Baines is a fine player, but they they lose something for sure with Serge and Marcus all leaving. Um and so that's kind of like why – and Kyle Lowry is a year older. We'll kind of see how he looks th- through a season that is uh, going to be a sprint. Um, but, I, I mean, this isn't like a, a, to disrespect the, the Raptors. I think the Raptors are very good. I think that Nick Nurse is either the first, second, or third best coach in the entire NBA. Um, but when I look at Milwaukee, the moves that they made – for the regular season, um, especially they're very impressive. Giannis will be, uh, even as someone who just won two MVPs, like, uh, that dude's going to be super trying to, uh, crush everything in his, in his sights after, um, how his season ended. Uh, I think Boston is in a little bit of a pickle from the gate with Kemba's injury and adjusting to Gordon's, uh, uh, Gordon not being on the roster anymore, but I expect uh, Jalen to be, uh, I don't know if significantly better. I don't know if we can say like guys are going to make seismic leaps from year to year because the last season literally just ended, but I expect Jalen to be better in some areas of his game that were considered weaknesses in the past. And I expect Jason Tatum in particular to make strides as a playmaker. And I mean, his bubble was, uh statistically like uh, unprecedented like totally remarkable 25 10 and 5 um uh averages which is just like not something people do um let alone someone as young as he is so the expectations are through the roof for him to kind of pick up the slack and the role players around them um you know you add two veterans and Tristan Thompson and Jeff Teague and uh, two capable guys who make sense on the team. And uh, there's a lot of rookies and, uh, you know, second year players who I think are very capable in their roles. Grant Williams, Rob Williams. Um, we're going to see what happens with Aaron Neesmith. But, uh, but yeah, so that's how I feel about the Celtics and the Bucks. Um, the Sixers just look like a team that makes sense now. And a lot of people had them me included getting to the finals last year. Um, They jettison Al Horford and, uh, you know, add three point shooting with uh, 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 Seth Curry and Danny green, who just wins the championship every single year. So I'm never counting out a team that has Danny green on it. 
even though he looked not great <laughs> at points in the bubble. Um, and I just like, I just like the, the, like the idea of adding shooting around, uh, Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons just makes so much sense. And so that team is a potential juggernaut if Joel Embiid kind of wakes up uh, in a lot of ways. Um, so I can't really rule them out. I just think from a t- pure talent perspective, they have uh, their ceiling on the defensive end um, and the offensive end is so, so high. Um, and then like the Nets are, I guess, the last team here. And I mean, like, it would not shock me. I think you said this. It would not shock me if the Nets won the championship this year. I think that um, I'm assuming that Kevin Durant is going to look like 95% of Kevin Durant. Obviously, if he's not, then this completely changes everything. But uh, assuming that you have Kevin, a healthy Kevin Durant, who is the best player in the conference, um, in my opinion, and uh, just this roster that is like Kyrie's obviously talented, whatever, but like the roster is just so deep, like at every position, like they could do a hockey lineup, um, hockey lineup substitutions. Steve Nash could for like s- stretches of the season if he wanted to, and they think they would be fine. I think their defense is a little bit of a question mark, um, but uh, you know, they didn't really have any wing defenders last season and the way that they played mostly under Kenny Atkinson granted, but the way that they played defensively was just so smart. They forced so many long twos. Um, They were very conservative. They played defense like the Milwaukee bucks. They weren't as good as the bucks, but they had a lot of success with it given their personnel deficiencies. So um, a team that's just as talented as they are with Karis, with Spencer, um, Joe Harris, who's uh, still somehow underrated despite signing that massive contract. Um, I just love uh, love everything that that's happening in Brooklyn. Assuming that their defense is at least league average, because I expect their offense to be top three uh, with a bullet. Uh, so that's kind of how I just feel about the top two tiers. So yeah so that those are basically the top two tiers um and I know it was pretty long winded but like what are your thoughts on everything that I just said okay, so agreed that the bucks are there they have Giannis. drew is had a huge trade package given for him, which makes sense because he's really good, but I think he's still underrated uh, via public perception. The 76ers, I was also one of the people last year who picked them to win the championship. I just think Joel Embiid is world-ending as a presence in a playoff series. And if he's healthy, that's great. As you said about Danny Green, he joins your roster, you win the chip. Simple math, that's how it works. As far as the Nets, I think you and I are farther apart on the Nets than probably any other team. I don't see top three offense with a bullet. I don't see it. And while I agree they are talent-laden, I'm not sure if that all coalesces into something meaningful, although I would not be shocked if it did. I'm very much just like a coward on the fence waiting to see what happens with that. But they certainly have all the talent. And as you said, presumptuously, they have Kevin Durant, the best player in in the conference, if he's healthy, which by all means he probably is. The Celtics stuff... I think the Celtics, when I rank them as they should be looking to win a chip, I think about a team that is ready-made for playoff basketball. So in the regular season, it wouldn't surprise me if they're a little bit lower than I initially thought. But in the postseason, I expect them to be just as dangerous as almost any team. That leaves the Raptors and the Heat. And I got to tell you, Michael, as someone who I felt like I was – perpetually shaking my fist, screaming at the sky that the Heat were frauds during the whole postseason last year. And Bam Adebayo just kept winning every matchup that was in front of him. And then Jimmy Butler showed out ridiculously well in the finals. And the Heat, they just, I feel like they jerry-rigged their way to the finals. But they did it. So I'm happy to see someone else has ranked them lower. And the Raptors, I feel like it's the same thing. They... It's a very interesting offseason, as you said. You look at the guys who came in and the guys who left. There's potential for a better offense this year, provided that Kyle Lowry is static, which, 
as we know about point guards who are over the age of 30, especially Lowry, as old as he is, that's not guaranteed. But if Lowry is close to static, they could have a better offense this year. But I assume that there's no way they'll have as good a defense. And that drops them down quite a bit. So those tiers, I feel like we have handled. Indiana gets their own solo spot. What do you think of the Pacers this year? So I, I also have Indiana in its own tier. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I mean, the only variable, I mean, maybe not the only one, because I think Aaron Holiday can be better, but like the biggest variable here is just Victor Oladipo. And what does he look like? Is he like contending for an all NBA team? Or is he the guy who we last saw on the floor who was just a total mess? Um, Obviously, physical health is an issue here. But so is, I think, fitting into this team that, you know, suddenly uh, Doma Sabonis is an all-star and you're running your offense through him and high pick and roll with Malcolm Brogdon religiously. You have the two bigs with Turner and Sabonis still because they couldn't get rid of Miles Turner in the sign and trade with the Celtics for Gordon Hayward. Um, like all the, like if you just look at continuity from last season to this season, the Indiana Pacers returned just about everybody um, a, the, a higher percentage of the previous season's minutes uh, to this season than any other team in the league. So they're basically like what they were. I don't see like any pieces beyond Oladipo who I'm pretty skeptical about right now, um, changing that for them and lifting them higher. Also like, I think Jeremy Lamb is, I don't really know off the top of my head what his injury situation is, but I don't think he's going to be 100% for a little while. Um, So, and he was decent for them uh, last year for stretches. So yeah, I'm not super like excited about the Pacers. Obviously they have a new head coach. Uh, We'll see how he kind of figures out um, how to make the dual big lineups work and make them a little bit more explosive or accentuate each of those guys individually by staggering their minutes. We'll see. Um, but like the Pacers are just like really solid, like a rock solid team that's going to get the six seed or the seven seed or whatever, and then get just smacked in the first round. That's like their destiny. Um, I thought that they were going to kind of blow this up, to be honest with you. Um, and based on their uh, their their payroll and their uh, head coach decision, I thought that they were going to head in the opposite direction, and they're not so far. So, like, yeah, they just kind of are what they are. Um, they bore me. <laughs> I don't mean to be mean, but they bore me a lot. I don't really <laughs> like watching them play. And a lot is on Oladipo's shoulders in a contract year. Yeah, I agree. It's they're such an interesting team and the answer becomes boring, right? Because the question is, can the Pacers capture Oladipo from 1718, TJ Warren from the bubble and mix it with the consistency of Brogdon and Sabonis and just, Hey, we need that team to exist. Everybody at their peak. Then that team becomes maybe really, really interesting. And they could, you know, they start going closer to the the tier of 76ers and well just they could contend they could get to the finals if everybody is operating at a high enough clip and they've all operated at high clips at different times in their careers that's the problem with it and when I look at that team and I say can they do that it doesn't seem very likely especially since Oladipo not only isn't that guy or has it been that guy, but he's also reportedly been trying to leave the team very aggressively to the point of asking other teams like trade for me, please, which is, you know, that's a a guy can do whatever he wants and it makes for great content, but it's not a great look for the Pacers. And I think it's, it's incredible to think that Malcolm Brogdon, maybe if he stays in Milwaukee, they win a championship And now he's just on this middling Indiana team. And it's not his fault. It's just the way that the NBA plays out sometimes. A guy who would belong in a certain place at one point in time is somewhere else. And so everybody fails. Atlanta, Washington, and Orlando. Is that your 
is that the tier that falls for you or is yours different? It's close. Um, my tier is Atlanta, Washington, and Charlotte, actually. <sighs> I was close to that. So I guess like I'll start by just talking about Orlando, actually, because they're the kind of the odd team out. Um, I'm thinking about writing about this in the f- near future, but like Orlando just uh, their lack of direction, like is so frustrating to me. And this is an organization that like, this is the, there is no better time right now to take a step back and go in the opposite direction than Orlando right now. Like their ceiling is their ceiling is the eight seed, right? Maybe the seven seed. And then just getting absolutely obliterated again in the first round of the playoffs. They'll win the first I game. Just, <laughs> I t- sure, yeah, they'll win the first game and then there will be a strike. Well, then they'll come back and just get demolished. That's what's going to happen again. Um, no, like I just mentioned the Pacers having all this continuity. I think Orlando is second or third in the percentage of minutes from last season to this season carried over. And this decision was made like these decisions were made knowing that Jonathan Isaac is probably not going to play. And he might be honestly like your franchise player at this point. Like I adore Jonathan Isaac. I think his game is just so perfect, particularly on the defensive end. I think he has defensive player of the year potential someday um, if he can stay healthy, but like I'm just really confused by Aaron Gordon still being on this team and what, like why I, I like there were rumors about um, the uh, Portland Trailblazers offering the same package, Trevor Ariza and a, and a, and a first round pick the 16th overall pick for Aaron Gordon before they eventually got Robert Covington from Houston. Um, it's like, why would you not take that deal <laughs> if you are Orlando? It just, it's, it's, it's silly to me, honestly. Um, I don't think you can get better than that package for him at this point. Um, I know that like the, like I, I, the Celtics have this big, I don't want to turn this into a Celtics pod, but the Celtics have a big trade exception. And and if you're not going to give him up for Ariza's expiring tradable contract and a first round pick in the middle of the first round, then what, like, I just don't know what you're doing there. Um, they lose basically the only change over is they lo- they lose uh, DJ Augustine, who was really important for them and a really good player um, and replace him with Cole Anthony, um, who's a rookie. That's like really the only change made. I'm just like flabbergasted by um, Orlando. Okay. So um, yeah, so that's why I, I just don't, I'm not a fan of Orlando and what they're doing, and I can't uh, condone their behavior in the front office uh, by putting them in a higher tier. So um, I guess like the other two teams, three teams that uh, are in this tier for me are just like real, they're going to be really fun to watch. Um, and that's kind of how I've, I'm, I'm labeling them. I love the Atlanta Hawks. I love their offense. Um I love the decisions that they made with bringing in Bogdan and signing Danilo Gallinari and how those two complement Trey Young. And it'll be interesting to see just how Lloyd Pierce kind of finagles the lineups there and how all offense he goes versus, uh, versus trying to balance things out with guys like Chris Dunn and, and, and Clint Capella. Um, Washington, just Russell Westbrook, period. Very exciting. Um, and Charlotte, LaMelo Ball, very exciting. <laughs> That's my analysis for those two teams. Yeah, it's, it's interesting what you said about Orlando. For, wait, quick question. If you're Portland, would you rather have Covington or Aaron Gordon? That is a very interesting question. I think that Covington fits fine with how Portland wants to play. But I think that Aaron Gordon is a better player and can ha- help Portland do different things. And I think that Aaron Gordon is a better defender on the ball and can guard bigger wings. Like, um, like if you want to win the championship, which they're, that's their goal, you're going to have to have people who can guard Kawhi Leonard and LeBron James in single coverage and like make them work 
And I don't think Robert Covington can do that. Uh, but I do think Aaron Gordon can do that. Yeah, he's a, he's a lurker. He's a really good off-ball defender. On-ball has slipped some. Okay, that, that was a good answer. Okay, so Orlando, they're confusing. They have very little upside, but are very nervous to throw it away, looking for a higher upside in the form of rebuild. Confusing. Atlanta agreed. The question is, there's two timelines for that roster. You have Kevin Herter, DeAndre Hunter, Cam Reddish sitting and you bring in Danilo Gallinari, you bring in Bogdan Bogdanovich, you bring in Rondo, you bring in a lot of these players, you draft on Yeka Kongu, and it seems like there's two timelines, one of veterans, one of younger players. Who's going to play? Do they go with Capella at the five? Do they go with Collins at the five and chase a 125 offensive rating and see how the defense holds up at the back end? Who knows? Very intriguing, though. They should be able to score points. Washington, Russell Westbrook, as you say, Bradley Beal, obviously. Last year when we did this podcast, I said, is Washington maybe a playoff team? Bradley Beal is going to do some stuff. And you laughed and you said, no, I don't think you should be very excited about Washington. And I was right to be excited about Beal. And I was wrong to be excited about Washington. As, and you were correct. And Charlotte, Gordon Hayward, I think was as much as people don't like his politics and that's, you know, a very prominent uh, thing on Twitter, his on court game last year, I thought was severely underrated. I ranked him as a top 60 player in my top 100. I thought he was really, really strong for the Celtics last year. He brings a sense of normalcy to a lot of the out of control sets that the Hornets would have to resort to that end up with, you know, incredible Devonte Graham heaves, that everybody loves to watch, but maybe don't lead to the best kind of offense. And LaMelo Ball is in there too. He is a a genius with the basketball. His interpretations of the floor are always interesting. So yeah, I I don't blame you at all for putting Charlotte above Orlando. But I spoke about, what was it, inertia at the top of the podcast. And I think Zach Lowe said the same thing for Orlando. You, You said there was a big carryover in their minutes. We'll see. Who's to say? But That leaves us with Chicago and then Detroit, New York, and Cleveland. Are those tiered all the same for you? Or does Chicago, is it a little bit of a step up? Hmm. I mean, um, first of all, I'm going to (sighs) put, organizing this is tough in my brain. (laughs) I think that that Orlando is, um, I want to just put them in the last tier, bottom tier out of spite. And I want to put them with... (laughs) I'm going to put them with Cleveland and New York. Um, I just, I mean like the actual basketball observer in me knows that New York and Cleveland are going to be a lot worse than Orlando, but this is, I I can do what I want. So that's (laughs) what I'm doing. This is my tier. Um, Chicago is really weird to me. Honestly, I can see Chicago making the playoffs. I can't see Detroit making the playoffs to, to be honest with you. And I think that the Blake Griffin situation and just the, I I mean, the whole front court is just such a mess. Um, and their off season still really, really puzzles me. And I, they only have a front court. That's it. Just front court. They have a, exactly like Jeremy Grant's going to be playing point guard when they, after they trade Derek Rose, because I mean, the Derek Rose trade is, is happening. Like that's just, that's, I will like lock that down. That's definitely going to occur before the deadline. Um, but like they lose, I, I mean, like you need to have minutes for like uh, Seku Dumbuya and uh, just, other young pieces on this roster decision to pay all this money to Jeremy Grant, the decision to bring in Mason Plumley and Jalil Okafor and just like, uh, like antiquated skill sets that uh, you're just like overlapping. Like, didn't you watch Troy Weaver? Didn't you watch um, like the Philadelphia 76ers at the beginning of the process? Like it just, it doesn't work out when you invest at that position. Um, that heavily and it honestly feels like there was uh, I just made fun of Trey Weaver but like it honestly feels like there were like three or four people making decisions and having say and making separate phone calls and separate deals and then at the end of the night they all kind of met up 
and said like, okay, who'd you sign? It's like, there was just no coherence to the pieces that they got. So like, I, I just, I, I don't see a, a, a line or a light, I should say for um, Detroit making the play or making the playoffs. Um, Chicago though is like, I go back and forth in my head about them and they also brought back a lot of the same pieces and they obviously have a new coach who will institute a more rational defensive philosophy and not have his guys scrambling around the floor. Like guys like Lowry Markinen and Wendell Carter rim on all pick and rolls was just like a ludicrous strategy to employ. Um, and really doesn't make sense. So I think Billy Donovan being there will be really good. Otto Porter should be healthy. Um, I, I like. I think there's a lot of talent here. I think Colby White's really good. Um, I think their offense has upside, and I, I'm really looking forward to seeing um, what impact their rookie can have, um, if any. Uh, they seem to be super high on him. Um, so, like, Chicago could be terrible this year, but they also have these veteran pieces that make me feel like, um, okay, like last year I thought that Chicago was going to be really good and kind of contend for a playoff spot and it didn't work out because of injury issues, but like they still have Thad Young. Uh, they have Thomas Sedaransky. Um, they added Garrett Temple. Like I think this team is trying to make the playoffs for sure. And steps forward by marking in and in particular Wendell Carter on the defensive end and being a more assertive offensive player. I think the Chicago bulls could punch their way into a playoff spot. Yeah. Agreed. It's Chicago last year. I think it was you that said, you know, there's a lot of offensive upside when we did this podcast last year, when I look at that team now, Patrick Williams, the guy they drafted, he looks really nice. He shot up the draft boards a bunch right before the draft. He ended up going fourth. They're an interesting squad. I like Kobe White a lot too. There's a lot of talent there. When we're looking at Detroit, I think it's funny because they drafted Killian Hayes, who was my favorite guard in the draft, probably my favorite player in the draft. And they just stuck him on that team and said, hey, pal, you're going to have to make sense of all the things you're going to have to play with as far as just Big man, big man, big man, and big man. Kind of like Dylon from the Chappelle show. And they did the same thing with Trey Young in Atlanta, except Trey Young creates exceptional shots for everybody around him. And there's more talent there. And Detroit is just giving Killian Hayes the keys to like a moped that runs every third day or something like that. So that, that confuses me. And as far as Chicago stuff, there's talent there. They have to convert that talent into something tangible, like wins. If wins are tangible, I guess it depends on who you're asking, <laughs> to be honest. Okay, New York and Cleveland. I will have no R.J. Barrett slander as a Canadian. I cannot allow it, okay? We have our precious high draft picks that we need to protect from slander lest they fall down the, the wayside of Anthony Bennett hallway. What are your thoughts on those two teams, New York and Cleveland? I, I mean, I was actually going to start my answer slandering RJ Barrett. I'm sorry, but I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I am, uh, I'm currently working on a piece that I don't want to step on too much, but um, I was looking around, fiddling around on second spectrum. And I came across this uh, stat that basically indicated that um the uh that outside shooters three-point shooters had a higher uh field goal percentage shooting percentage uh beyond the arc when rj barrett was their closest defender based on what they would have otherwise shot than any other defender in the league i know that i worded that really confusingly but basically um his defense on the perimeter was like luck goes into this in a lot of ways, but like his defense on the perimeter was like worse than anybody else. And I've watched a, a ton of footage of him just having absolutely no awareness on when to close out, how to close out who he was closing out on. Um, and that's a huge part of basketball. Um, and so maybe Tibbs will fix that, but that was a big reason why their defense, I mean, their defense was really bad um, last year, but it was like so much worse with R.J. Barrett on the floor than without, that it's really startling. Um, 
the Knicks are besides I'm sorry to get that RJ Barrett slander out of the way. The Knicks are like really um I don't know, they're bad. Like I don't really know what else to say about them. They don't really interest me at all. Um I guess I'm looking forward to seeing Obi Toppin. I'm looking forward to seeing um like I just every like all I do is, when I think about the New York Knicks is associate them with the University of Kentucky, and it seems like every other signing went to the University of Kentucky, and they hired John Calipari's uh, longtime assistant coach uh, in the off season, and it just it feels like they're just being a Kentucky pipeline, and this has nothing to do with how they're going to perform this year, but that's just a funny thing that i'm noticing about them they're laundering um, kentucky products is what you're saying exactly it's like kentucky produces some really good players so i get this strategy but like it's just so transparent it's it's it makes me laugh um so yeah the knicks are still going to be really bad and uh good for them um and then like cleveland man like cleveland might be the team i just don't want to watch more than any other team in the league this year. I am interested to see um, just is this like, I I'm pretty high on Darius Garland still. I think like his floater is just so buttery and some statistics with Colin Sexton are interesting and just his production um, uh, as a lead ball handler. I don't think he'll ever be one on a winning team, but just uh, he intrigues me. I don't think he's, uh, that doesn't mean I think he's like good or anything, but I just want to see what he has out there. He's like super fast. And if he stops taking those really long twos, he could be a little bit more efficient. Um, but yeah, like they lose Tristan. I keep forgetting Kevin loves even in the league. Uh I, you know, they tried to shore up the the perimeter defense in the draft, um, but I don't think a rookie can solve that problem for them. And so, uh, you know, you mentioned Gordon Hayward being really good earlier. Like uh, every time the Celtics played the Cleveland Cavaliers, Gordon Hayward had like 45 points because they just literally had nobody to guard him. Um, so, so yeah, like uh, Cleveland's going to be, just atrocious and maybe if i was redoing this exercise i would have them in the bottom tier all by themselves you're not excited for larry nance at the three because i'm i'm excited for larry nance at the three (laughs) i i am not excited um i just remembered andre drummond is on the team too so i just want to just want to shout him out that's defensive player of the year vote getter andre drummond to you michael okay (laughs) you have to acknowledge his Mm -hmm incredible prowess on the defensive end and before we get out of here because i i feel like you hit the head on the you hit the nail on the head with those two teams i don't have much to say outside of uh, my snide comments at the end regarding their rosters um the rj barrett slander has gone too far you sir have made an enemy out of me uh do you have anything else you want to talk about before we get out of here uh no i'm i'm good this was fun um love previewing the east i hope raptors fans don't get too upset at me i hope heat fans don't get too upset at me um and yeah i can't believe the season is about to start it's just so wild it's too short it's it's there hasn't been enough time off but you know full steam ahead here we go but uh before we get out of here do you have anything to plug uh the floor is yours mate um I mean, everyone who's listening to this, I hope, uh, can subscribe to the Open Floor podcast, where I co-host twice, two episodes a week with uh, Ben Golliver of the Washington Post. And we have a lot of fun over there. So uh, everyone who's listening to this should continue to listen to this podcast. But if you could listen to two in a week, that would be uh, (laughs) superb of you and much appreciated. Um, and I, I don't know when this is going up, but I have an article coming out later, later today or tomorrow morning about Christian Wood with the Houston Rockets and why he is a silver lining addition to that team. And, uh, as we were recording this, we got word from Adrian Wojnarowski that, uh, that 
uh, James Harden has uh, landed in Houston and uh, gotten tested for, for, for COVID-19. <laughs> uh, so that's how that situation is going. Um, but yeah, if, uh, that'll be on 538 if people want to check that out as well. Man, I thought you were going to say he got traded to Philly. And I was like, what? <laughs> well, I missed that right as we're recording. But uh, okay, I'm glad he landed and got tested. I like Christian Wood a lot. I'm glad you wrote about him. I'm actually super excited for that piece. Uh, listener, this will be out maybe mere hours before that piece comes out. Uh, you'll probably listen to it during the piece's inception into the world. Inception. Uh, ex- explication. Something into the world. There's, there's an exiting form from the website. Anyway, and uh, yeah, you should go read that from Michael. I enjoy all of his pieces as should you. And yeah, the Open 4 podcast, give that a listen. As he said, if you can manage two podcasts uh, in a week, it's, it's a tough ask, but uh, maybe you'll do it for him. Michael, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on, man. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. All right, listener. That's it for Michael. That's it for me. That's it for you. Whether you're getting into this in the morning or at night, have a blessed day and goodbye. 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 Goodbye.